Hello there, welcome to our very last Talking Europe of 2019. For the end of the year, we thought we'd take a bit of a lighter look at Europe through the eyes of someone who's made a career out of studying the differences between us all and making us laugh about it. Paul Taylor, Brit in Paris, bilingual comedian. Thanks very much for being our guest. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's wonderful, <laughs> but not excité. Not excité, no, because that's, uh, that's, uh, that's probably the first uh, mistake that I made uh, in French. Because uh, it means like excited in a in a, in more a sexual way, yeah, in a more yeah. sort of like oh, I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> and in English, we just say we're excited for everything. We're d we're delighted that you're here. <laughs> we're we're going to start off for our viewers with the video that made you famous. Okay. I, I think I can say uh, this is Paul trying to get his head around the very French concept of that cheek kiss that everybody here uses to say hello, and it kind of foxes British people particularly. It's called la bise. Take a look. For girls, it's okay, because they just give everyone kisses. But it's not my choice. But for guys, it's different, because we kiss the girls, but sometimes we also have to kiss the guys. Before moving to Paris, my face had never touched another man's face. So imagine my reaction when my friend Robert tried to say hello to me one day. Hey, Paul, on fait ce bise? Ah, give me a kiss. Get out of here. Paul watching that with his head in his hands, you just said you hate watching that. But it yeah. is the video that made you famous. It is, yeah. I, I, I hate it, but I, I, like, I will be forever indebted to that. So what was it about France that inspired you to start doing comedy? Because you didn't come here as a comic, right? No, I didn't. I, I, I enjoyed doing comedy. I tried doing a couple of open mic nights in London before I moved here in 2009 when I started doing comedy. And I don't know if it was a, it was a specific inspiration from the French, but it was just more my my everyday life as a foreigner in France mm. um, was what I talked about in stand up. People talk about what you know what they're feeling, and and that's what I was feeling at the time, uh, and still am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, even after ten years, there are still things that come up. I bet. Yeah. Um, so, do you feel like you're a bit of an ambassador? For the UK, when you're doing your shows, you do it part French, part English, bit of a mishmash. Yeah, I don't feel that I am, but I, I, I understand that I am in the sense that I, I, the people that come to the show and the people that follow me uh, on the work that I put out online, uh, they definitely see me as kind of the face of, of the UK mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for French people, which is cool. But there's uh, again, there's other English people that don't like that as well, that uh, hate me just because, you know, I, you know, I can be rude and I can swear a lot and I can be shouty, screamy. It's just my type of humor. Um, so yeah, it's but it's 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 cool. I think the French have never really had this type of humor like mm. be seen on 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 TV and stuff. You know, the French people always talk to me about Monty Python, about Mr. Bean, and and kind of references that are you know a few Quite decades old. old. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, yeah, it's fun. So you are now doing comedy in the time of Brexit, mm -hmm. something that we've talked about endlessly on Talking <laughs> I can Europe, imagine. I can tell you. Um, I came to see your show in Paris. Uh, it, Brexit doesn't massively come into that. Do you actively avoid talking about politics? Uh, I don't actively avoid it. It's just not something that inspires me too much because um, I, ha on it, I haven't lived enough time in any country to... Uh, to, to follow politics of that country. France is starting to get there. I've been here for 10 years, uh, all, all like 10 years in a row now. Um, whereas in, in the UK, it was, I was, you know, there was a couple of three years that I was there. Then I was in Spain for a couple of years and then back in France. So I was moving around so much. It's just really difficult to, to, to keep a handle of what's going on politically. And also getting older, mm. I'm getting more interested in it because, you know, when you're in your 20s and you're at university, you're just, you know, you, you, it's not really something that, that interests you or that interested me or my group of friends. 10 years ago. Mm. So, well, yeah. many people see Brexit as quite a rich seam mm -hmm. to mime. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, now that we know that the UK is going to be leaving the UK, EU at some point? <laughs> is it? <laughs> are you Are you going to be, do you think, perhaps bringing that in a bit more? Do you think Brexit's going to change things for you? I think it might do. I think it's, I, I feel it almost, uh, going back to the ambassador thing, I feel like it's almost... Uh, obligatory for me to talk about it, it, it from my point of view to, to French people. So I think I might, once it's once it's done and dusted, which I don't know when that'll be, um, to do a show about it and talk about, you know, kind of dumb it down after mm -hmm. the three years that it's been going on, like here's the, the, the situation. So I think I might do, um, but it's just, yeah, trying to find humour in politics can be difficult if you don't know really what you're talking about. And I, I've got no idea what I'm talking about, but I mean, just getting quotes out from the different prime ministers and the different mm -hmm. uh, things that have been happening can be funny enough. So yeah. 
As well as your show, uh, you did a TV programme with yeah. Canal Plus here in France called Stereo Trip. Yeah. Um, it was about finding out the truth about different European stereotypes. Um, I really loved particularly the episode you did about Germans. Uh -huh. uh, the other language I did at university was German. And there's that stereotype, isn't there, that Germans always follow the rules, yeah. always following orders. They like things to be strict. It seems that through, through doing this programme, you really did find out that, yeah, OK, cliches are true. But also not really true. Yeah, it's it was a it was a fun program to make because we you know we asked online uh, for my to my community what are the stereotypes that you have about these six countries mm. and we'll go to the countries and find out if they're true or not and if they are true why are they true if they're not true why do we think they're true mm. and what ended up happening most of the time is that we found that the stereotype was true but and it was the exploring the but that was really mm. interesting uh, so the, the the Germans following the rules was a was a, was an interesting one and I think one close to my heart living in Paris where no one follows any of the rules. <laughs> there are lots of rules in yeah. Paris. <laughs> I mean, there's rules about everything. There's, there's laws about where you should ride your bike and where you should drive, and, but no one follows them and there's no repercussions. Mm. And I, it's funny because I think further the further north you go in Europe, the more people follow the rules. The further south you go, the, le the, the less the rules are respected. Um, so yeah, it was a really fun, uh, it was a really fun experiment uh, putting that together and, and seeing the different stereotypes. And do you think that um, as a Brit in Paris, you're getting more or less stereotypical just for myself? <laughs> I've become English in, more English in some ways. Like I actually do travel with my own tea bags now. I'm just <laughs> ashamed to say, because I love a good cup of tea so much. I'm not that much. bad. Uh, but I'm more French in others. Like I will not get into a lift and not say bonjour to people. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I do. I feel sometimes obliged to, to become more 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 British as well uh, when I'm in France. So yeah, I'll bet there's certain things that I'll behave, uh, like I sign off my emails with cheers. Um, I don't know why, it's just, I just feel like this, it's thing that, that I would probably not do that much in, in England if I was still living there. But yeah, it, I behave more, more English in certain places and then more French uh, in others. Uh, mm. When I go back to England, I'm going, oh God, uh, what's going on here? So then I, I turn into my French, I, I switch on the French self Sometimes when I'm in England, I'll speak French mm. uh, on purpose with my wife uh, because I just don't want to be seen as an English person. I think it's a really <laughs> weird identity crisis. Yeah. It helps you in the in initial conversation with somebody. If they say they're German or they're Spanish, you go, oh, okay, cool. Mm. It helps you. It, you'll build a stereotype in your mind, which will be, you know, obviously exaggerated, but some of it's true. You know, if mm. you're going to a meeting with, with people from Latin countries, Spain, Italy, um, they tend to be a little bit later than, you know, to arrive later than people from Germany or Sweden. Uh, so you kind of have that prepared. But it, then saying oh, oh, Spanish people are lazy is obviously a massive uh, preconception. Absolutely. Now, over here in France, I've noticed people often blame British newspapers uh, for spreading all kinds of stereotypes. <laughs> and let's say it, out and out fake news as well. Yeah. Uh, there was the, the famous up yours Delors front page on the Sun newspaper that was very famous that I've shown to some... French friends, and they've said, well, I should find this shocking. How is that possible? Um, what did you actually know about Europe or the EU as you were growing up? What, it's a good question. I, didn't, I mean, obviously, you know, you know about Europe. I don't, politically, I didn't know anything, uh, really, because, again, I didn't really follow it, and it wasn't, it wasn't one of my interests. Um, but I did appreciate the fact that you can, you, know, you can go to different countries and work freely and live there without having to, you know, sort out visas and figure all that kind of stuff out. So mm. that was kind of the main thing was the 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 movement of people rather than all the the other stuff economically, um, the cur the, the currencies that came together to make the euro, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, I think was less uh, interesting to me uh, growing up. Well, on our show, uh, we cover the European Union itself quite a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of stereotypes about the actual European Union as well. We're quite avid followers of all kinds of fake news here on Front City 4. <laughs> so let's just have a look together at one uh, item of fake news that we spotted on the Europe team. It made loads of headlines, but it wasn't at all true. Is the EU messing around with Austrian schnitzel? That's what Austrian Chancellor Kurt suggested early in May 2019 in a statement released to the main Austrian press agency, APA. It's true that the EU does have strict food safety standards, but we couldn't find any about schnitzel. This isn't the first time Europeans' favourite snacks have been dragged into political rows. In December 2017, rumours swirled that the EU was planning to ban doner kebabs. 
The British newspapers Daily Express and Daily Telegraph were among those to spread the misleading report. In fact, the EU Parliament was considering restricting on health grounds a particular ingredient commonly but not exclusively found in kebabs, phosphates. In any case, the phosphate ban was defeated by a margin of three votes. In the same fatty vein, Belgians have long feared that their beloved fries were at risk of an EU ban too. Cooking oil and methods are well regulated in certain cases, but chip stands don't come into it. Here again, the rumours aren't true. So in summary, no, Austrian schnitzel is not in danger from EU regulations. Your snacks are safe. You enjoyed that. So yeah, I just find it funny how we're obsessed with food. Like the whole, you know, yeah. everyone, and it doesn't mention anything about England, whereas our food is... Uh, Interesting <laughs> it, yeah, for is, Europeans. It's more debatable than, than, than schnitzels and how they're cooked. So, uh. And I think that that kind of sort of shows or highlights really how I think Personally, one of the stereotypes about the European Union is it's this big rulemaking body that's always clamping yeah. down on things and telling you what to do. Absolutely, yeah. Well, and, and I have the discussion with my dad quite a lot because he uh, he voted Brexit uh, at the time, even though he's lived in France and uh, Spain. Um, and his thing was, yeah, it, it, the, the 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 reason was it was he was tired of regulations from Brussels made by people that he didn't vote for. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I think there's this scaremongering thing going on about rules. Mm. But to be fair with food, I mean, if they were like, if, if, if <laughs> you can guarantee in France, if they said, yeah, Brussels is going to is gonna get rid of the words pain au chocolat and everyone has to say chocolatine, there'd be uproar and Revolution. France would leave the EU in about five seconds. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's interesting. Food, food really... Um, gets people passionate. Yeah. And all these stereotypes, I mean, they're often thrown about, you know, in fun, but they can be used as well to sow division mm -hmm. and stoke nationalism. Uh, you know, the image we often see in British newspapers of, of Germans ordering everybody about, for example, Italians being disorganized and threatening the economy. These things come up and people from those countries tell me about it. Do you think as someone who's traveled around the continent, speaking to all these people about these cliches, do we still need to try and get to know each other better? And, and how would we do that? Yeah, I think so. I think, I, I mean, the the worst part is is having the basic stereotypes and you know using them as insults or using them as ways to to, to divide us. Uh, the idea with the program uh, that I made and just stuff that I do on stage in general is to talk about the stereotypes but laugh about them and learn things and come together more. Because yeah, absolutely, there's no there's no way that getting to know each other better would be a downside. Um, we have to keep talking, keep discovering new things about each other, and uh, it'll help us understand how we you know how we operate as people as well. All right, well, I'd just like to show another little extract from uh, your current show and talk about how being in another country can actually impact your own sense of identity and start this process of maybe not knowing who you are as well. Uh, so this is from Paul's current show, which is on in The Flow in Paris. I now am losing my English and I'm starting to make the same mistakes that French people make when they speak English. What I do now is I take f***ing French words, I make them English and I think that they're English words. <laughs> but they're not English words. All the time! This show, So British ou Presque, the original title that I had in my head was Rebecoming British. It's a great f***ing title. Until I asked my friends in England, I'm like, guys, what do you think about the title Rebecoming British? They're like, Paul, you're a f***ing idiot. Because Rebecoming is not an English word. Oh. Mais en français, tu deviens et tu redeviens. But you become and you re-become, no? <laughs> no, Paul, you're an idiot. You become and then you become again. Ah. Oh. <laughs> to become again British is a <laughs> title for a show. Oh. There we go. So that's Paula on stage. We had to bleep out a couple of words there uh, for our audience. And just to see then how French you have become. OK. You seem to be saying that, that you've become quite French. Uh, yeah, in certain situations I've become uh, uh, very French, yeah. OK, well, I've got a, a quiz for Paul now. Let's do it. That we're going to do. Gonna oh, the lights out. are going down. Lights I love it. lights are going down. It's serious. It's like who wants to be a millionaire when they go... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go. Paul Taylor, how French are you? First question. What must you do with your eyes when you're chinking glasses with somebody in a toast? You've obviously got to look them in the eyes, because otherwise uh, you have bad sex for seven years, apparently. Correct and very complete answer. How <laughs> do I many... get an extra bonus point? <laughs> <laughs> How many distinct varieties of cheese are there in France? To the oh, nearest hundred. From uh, To the nearest hundred? Uh, four? 1,200. 1,200? No. Which came first, the London Tube or the Paris Metro? The London Tube. 
Very good. The first metro system in the entire world. OK, I've got some quotes for you. Who said Paris is a movable feast? Paris is a movable feast. It was a writer. It was a writer. Oh, I don't... I, no. I, I've got no idea. Ernest Hemingway. OK, uh, historical figure. I cannot prevent the French from being French, said. Ah! Some president from somewhere. Yeah. Pre US president. A French one. A, Fre a French president? No idea. Charles de Gaulle. Well, just one last quote for you. When the seagulls follow the trawler, it is because they think sardines will be thrown in the sea. This depends how much of a football fan you are. Eh, no. Eric Cantona. OK, the final killer question. Which city is rainier, Paris or London? Oh, well, it depends. Uh, there's more quantity in Paris, but there's less rainy days in Paris. So it rains... It rains more days in London, but the, it is less <laughs> rain in London. That is the correct answer. How? End no, of I the quiz. Thank you very much, Paul Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> that is as well the end of our programme. I hope our viewers played along with that. Thank you so much for being our guest. Uh, I know you're taking your show from the flow in Paris. A couple more dates there on tour all around France. Yep. Uh, 2020's first half is tour in France and then the rest is uh, internationally. So Fantastic. Yeah. All right. We wish you the best of luck for that. Happy New Year as well, of course. Yeah. Have a bonne année. Bonne année. And bon année to our viewers as well. Hope to see you in part two of the programme. Stay with us. That's in a couple of minutes time.